Our series is entitled Modern Psychoanalysis, Adaptations and Advances to emphasize our commitment to the ongoing evolution and advancement of psychoanalysis as a profession and as a provider of therapies of depth, insight, relationship, and inclusion for people of all sorts and conditions. We are mindful that some of the most important adaptations and advances in psychoanalysis have occurred in collaboration with other disciplines and movements notably social work and community mental health. Elizabeth Danko has traced this pattern back to the earliest days of psychoanalysis in her wonderful book on Freud's free clinics. And Joe Cantor moves this narrative forward in his wonderful book, Face to Face with Children, The Life and Work of Claire Winnicott. Claire Britton Winnicott was part of a second generation of psychoanalytic pioneers one who married psychoanalysis with her first profession of social work in ways that transformed both disciplines, as you will hear. She also married Donald Winnicott, by the way, and their marriage was one of profound intimacy, collaboration, exploration, creativity, and service to many troubled people, including many difficult children. In this presentation, Joe Cantor will share with us a closer look at this amazing partnership and one that at last does equal justice to Claire's original contributions. Joe Cantor has been a practicing social worker since completing his graduate education at Smith College, Smith College School of Social Work in 1974. He's a graduate of the Advanced Psychotherapy Training Program at the Washington School of Psychiatry. He is currently a senior cl clinician with Fairfax County, Virginia Mental Health Services as in, and is in private practice in Silver, Silver Spring, Maryland. He's also an instructor in psychiatry at the George Washington University School of Medicine and a consulting editor of the Clinical Social Work Journal. Joel has taught, lectured, and written extensively on many topics involving community treatment of mentally ill clients, including case management, family consultation, and day treatment. His publications in these areas include several books and over 20 chapters and articles. His book, Face to Face with Children, The Life and Work of Claire Winnicott, includes a wonderful biography chapter written by Joel, as well as a wonderful collection of Claire's own writings, many of which I had not seen before. I found them in Joel's volume. So thank you, Joel, for being with us, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Wally and, and Lisa and the Philadelphia School. It's an honor to be here, and it's a great, great pleasure of mine to share my study uh, of Claire Winnicott, and, and often it, it leads into understanding better Donald Winnicott. I guess I've been at this now for uh, over 30 years. And uh, it's been uh, just a very pleasurable project uh, for me during this time. Now, I'm not going to, uh, you know, part of this is going to be uh, talking uh, from a paper, but I also have a lot of audio vi visual materials. You'll hear Claire talking about her work with Donald and her work with evacuated children during World War II. Uh, you'll see archival material, letters uh, that uh, Claire sent to uh, Donald during the war, which gives you a flavor of her and of their relationship. And, uh, and finally, I'll be sharing for the first time uh, an excerpt from a talk she gave about her psychoanalytic therapy with a quite troubled woman uh, in the last phase of her life, which re really gives you a sense of her, how she functioned as a psychoanalytic therapist. Uh, and this, uh, I've kept this, I've had to keep this under wraps for over 25 years because I, I encountered the patient uh, 
25 years ago who wanted to kept quiet, but she's now given permission to share this, uh, um, to share this. And we'll be publishing, uh, hopefully within the year, the full transcript of Claire's talk about this clinical work. And I think it's a quite, uh, I think you'll find this quite interesting. Uh, I'm going to start out um, by sharing um, a little a uh, brief introduction to the story from uh, uh, the graphic novelist, Alison Bechtel. I don't know if people are familiar with her. She uh, is best known for the book, Fun Home, which became a Tony award-winning Broadway play. And this is part of her, from her book, um, Are You My Mother? Which talks about her own personal journey or personal psychoanalysis and her interest in Winnicott. Anyhow, uh, this is uh, from part of Alison Bechtel's graphic novel. Uh, during the war, Winnicott took the train down to Oxfordshire once a week to consult with the staff of hostels for evacuated children. Here he met a social worker named Claire Britton. During the war, Winnicott took the, uh, part of Claire's job was to maintain a link between the kids and their parents. She'd go up to London regularly, work hard to track people down, convey messages, gifts. Sometimes she'd find the parent had been killed. Just continuing with uh, Bechdel's slides. Uh, Claire Britton was interested in analysis and eager to talk with Donald about his ideas. Good night, Dr. Winnicott, have you missed your train? Profound collaboration between, began between them that would shape both of their careers. Eventually, Claire would become an analyst herself. Now Donna was on the brink of a powerful breakthrough. Yes, Miss Britton, I'm stopping here tonight. Took a lot of encouragement on Claire's part, not to, let, not to mention several years, but at last they became lovers. The consummation was perhaps evidenced by a dream Donald had, which he gave Claire sunflower seeds. Um, Bechtel was very intrigued with the romance with them. He was 48 and she was 10 years younger. Uh, Claire would never get pregnant, but it's hard to imagine a more fruitful relationship. So that's, I'll use that as a brief introduction to my talk today. Now, while the work of Donald Winnicott is well known to most psychoanalysts, most are unaware of his professional collaboration with his second wife, Claire Britton, a pioneering social worker who worked in childcare or what is known in the United States as child welfare. She also worked in academia, government service and psychoanalysis over the course of a remarkable career. Known largely for her accomplishments in compiling and editing her husband's papers, Claire Britton Winnicott was a creative and talented social worker and analyst who expanded her husband's horizons, collaborating with him and exploring the interface between the psyche and environment. These qualities quickly impressed Donald when they became working together with evacuated children in 1941 and a lively professional collaboration eventually evolved into a more personal relationship. In response to this wartime experience and his collaboration with Claire, Donald's approach to treating children and his scholarly contributions evolved dramatically. As Rodman has noticed, during this relationship, which would continue the rest of his life, he became an entirely new kind of thinker and writer about the psychoanalytic understanding of human life. Similarly, in a 1946 letter to Claire, Donald wrote, quote, my work is really quite a lot associated with you. Your effect on me is to make me keen and productive. And this is all the more awful because when I'm cut off from you, I feel paralyzed for all action and originality. And I should note that he was still married to his first wife in 1946. However, apart from the impact of their personal relationship, their marriage, Claire and Donald's 30-year professional collaboration has been largely overlooked by Winnicott's biographers. In this paper, in this talk, 
I'll briefly review Claire's life and professional career before going into greater detail about her wartime collaboration with Donald, working with evacuated children with special needs. Finally, I will discuss what seems to be Claire's contributions to concepts that Donald is well known for, as well as ideas that might seem as quite independent contributions. Now for the purposes of simplicity and equity, I will be referring to both Claire and Donald by their first names throughout this pr presentation. I would note here that since Donald always used his initials in publications, I thought for many years he had some awkwardness about using his first name. But when I began my research and interviewed many who knew him personally, I know I learned that many colleagues and relatives had no difficulty addressing him as Donald. Now a little biography of uh, Claire. She was born in 1906 in the North of England and grew up as the oldest of four siblings in the home of a community-minded Baptist minister. After some early years working in YWCA's and youth ministries, she completed the social science course at the London School of Economics in 1938, before she took her first social work position with troubled youth in, de in depression ravaged Welsh town. After witnessing extreme poverty firsthand, one of her jobs was helping to distribute shoes to people who could not afford them. She returned to London School of Economics where she completed their prestigious mental health course under wartime time circumstances in Cambridge in 1941. She then spent the war working in Oxfordshire, supervising five hostels or group residences for troubled evacuees who were unable to cope with the routine placement in family homes. In this project, she worked alongside Donald, who was a psychiatric consultant on a one day a week basis. Their creative work with children during the war became known throughout Great Britain, and they emerged as leaders in a post-war movement to transform children's services in the United Kingdom. They co-authored two articles about their experiences with evacuated children. One in 1944 was entitled Problem of Homeless Children, and in 1947, they published Residential Management as Treatment for Difficult Children. As anyone who's read Winnicott, you know that he very rarely, there are very few papers that he co-authored with anybody. After the war, they offered joint testimony to the post-war commission that led to the establishment of a model, modern child welfare system throughout England. And Claire was appointed head of a new course to train social workers in child welfare at the London School of Economics. In this position, which she held until 1958, she trained a cadre of professional social workers in this emerging field. Although the exact details are unclear, they appear to have developed a deeply personal relationship during the war was Do while Donald was still married to Alice, his first wife. Donald had considerable conflict about leaving Alice and waited to do this until three weeks after his father's death at age 93 in December of 1948. And it's worth noting that soon after he moved out of Alice, he promptly had a heart attack. Uh, this was not easy for him. During the next several years, while the divorce proceedings wended its way through the courts, they lived together for much of this time and eventually married in 1951 several weeks after the divorce became final. Around 1950, Claire became a per began a personal psychoanalysis with Clifford Scott, the first British analyst formerly trained by Melanie Klein. When Scott moved to Canada in 1953, she began an analysis with Klein herself. Most likely, Donald played a direct role in this referral. In 1956, she entered formal psychoanalytic training at the British Psychoanalytic Society and was supervised there uh, by Michael Balint, Herbert Rosenfeld, and Hannah Siegel. Her analysis with Klein was a difficult experience. 
Uh, while she had respect for many of Klein's ideas, she also find, found Klein distant and impersonal. She was deeply disappointed by Klein when she returned to analysis after a life-threatening bout with meningitis. Claire told Klein that she had learned about trust from her experience with the hospital nurses. But Klein responded that, quote, this is simply a cover-up for your fear of death. Claire experienced this response as deeply unempathic. At another point, she stormed out of analysis after Klein spent 25 minutes interpreting a significant dream about Claire's mother. Claire told a colleague that Donald had to Klein call Klein personally in order to allow her to resume her analysis. She was disappointed both with Kleinian technique and the Kleinian faction at the society. But with Donald serving as president of the society at that time, she coped with her in the intolerance of dissent within the Kleinian group by remaining largely silent in her classes and compliantly submitting to supervision by Orthodox Kleinians. While she was in training, she directly expressed her concerns about Kleinian theory and practice in both her lectures to social work students as well as a paper that was published in a social work monograph where she only cited non-Kleinian analysts. Around the same time, and again, it's worth noting Donald is president of the society, he does a clinical, a critical review of Klein's book, Envy and Gratitude in a social work journal. I think both thought that Klein would never learn of these publications since they were in social work forums quite apart from psychoanalysis. Now, Claire's analysis with Klein continued until just before Klein's death in 1960. And in one of Klein's last professional actions, she sent word to the British Institute that Claire's analysis was complete. In 1964, Claire's career changed dramatically as she was appointed Director of Child Care Studies in the British government. In this position, she was responsible for the government's initiatives in training child welfare workers and administrators throughout the nation, effectively lobbying for dramatic budget increases, she established programs to train thousands of workers. And for distinguished government service, she was awarded the Order of the British Empire in 1971. 1971 was a tough year for Claire. Her husband died in January. And soon after facing retirement age, she left her government position as a bureaucracy was reorganized. Crippled with grief, she attempted to return to social work academia as chair of the social work department at the London School of Economics, but that did not work out very well. Uh, and she moved on finally in the last dozen years of her life as a psychoanalytic therapist. Besides teaching and supervising therapists, she also organized a group of analysts to edit and publish Donald's voluminous writings. And after suffering repeated operations from melanoma, she finally succumbed to this illness in 1984. Now her work with evacuated children in Oxfordshire was perhaps a defining experience of both Claire and Donald's lives and careers. Besides meeting each other, their respected talents emerged at a time when Great Britain was undergoing a dramatic change in both its understanding of childhood and its governmental child welfare programs. As many people in the United States are not aware, over 6 million people were evacuated from England cities to the countryside during the early years after the war, especially after the Blitz in September 1940. Families agonized about these separations. Should they put their child's physical safety ahead of the child's psychological needs for attachments? Fathers were off in the military, mothers were pressed into employment. Even with these massive evacuations, nearly 8,000 British children were killed by German bombing. Now, let me show you, I wanna share a little video about the evacuation.
now this historical period is, you know, as Americans, we really need to use some imagination to understand how different the war experience of the war was in England uh, than it was in the United States. First of all, it was two, it lasted two years longer. And, uh, and, you know, as I think most people are aware, there was very serious concern about that England would be invaded, that the war would end up on British soil. And when these children, the government did not force anyone to send their ch children away. But when these children left, they really didn't know if they'd see their parents again. You know, often the dad was off drafted in the military overseas. Uh, they didn't have email then. Phone calls were a luxury. Uh, children often had very minimal contact with their parents. And, and you know, there was an underlying level of anxiety for children and families that's really very, very different than it was in our country. Um, and so you had these kids who went out there, they were put into these foster homes who were not always thrilled to have them. They were mandated by the government to take these children. And as you can imagine, there were some children who couldn't deal with the stress of this very well. And there were other children who had major problems in the city, and they took those problems out under the stress of wartime to the countryside. So in various regions of the country, they basically created group homes, what they called hostels, for children who couldn't be kept with ordinary families. Now, personal testimony for me about this is one of the uh, fellows who helped me on this project was a social worker named Alan Cohn. And he did actually some of the tape interviews with Claire, and you're gonna hear bits of that later today. And uh, Alan went into, on to train at the London School of Economics. But I asked Alan, what was his experience during the war like? And he said, I spent the war in 10 different homes. I said, Alan, you know, why were you in 10 different homes during the war? said, I wet the bed. And you have to think about these families. You know, we take it for granted people have washing machines and dryers, but uh, a child who's wetting the bed is, you know, creating uh, a lot of stress for the family who has to wash the sheets on a daily basis, on a regular basis. So he kept shifting from home to home to home during the war. Uh, and that's just an example of what these children were experiencing. You know, literally every family was, in Britain was touched by this experience in one way or another. And the impact of the issues of attachment, loss, and separation could no longer be ignored by psychoanalysis. Although environmental factors in development were acknowledged by some before the war, they could not be ignored as the war proceeded. And this this experience impacted, of course, the thinking of Bowlby, of Anna Freud, who was running the Hampstead Nursery, and even Melanie Klein. And during this period, Winnicott and other independents emerged as significant voices within psychoanalysis. Now, unlike many of her fellow students from the prestigious London School of Economics, Claire deliberately avoided employment in child guidance clinics or mental hospitals. Uh, out at a pub with her fellow students, she told them, quote, I've enjoyed this course enormously, but the last thing I'm going to be is a psychiatric social worker. I want to be in the hurly-burly of what's going on in the world. So after she completed her training in 1941, she began working with evacuated children in Oxfordshire, an assignment that changed the course of her life. In this position, her primary responsibility involved administrative and professional supervision of 80 to 100 evacuees who were housed in five hostels. Because of special problem, these children were not able to achieve stable residence in family homes. And 
Donald Winnicott had been the consulting psychiatrist of the program. He visited from London every Friday, but Claire eventually retained the day-to-day -day responsibility for these hostels. And I'm gonna play a bit of Claire talking about what that experience was like when she first met, uh, met him. So let me read from Claire the transcript of this. Uh, Claire's words, when the war came, he couldn't avoid the problems thrown out by the vast disintegration of family life. The separation that went on, the children sent away, he, meaning Donald, had to face up to the more difficult problems. And he knew that when he took on the consultancy job for the government evacuation scheme, he knew that he was in for something quite different, a quite new experience for him. So he became consultant psychiatrist in the Oxford reception area where children were sent from London. And he became a consultant really to five hostels that were set up to take care of the children who couldn't be placed in ordinary homes children that nobody could manage. He'd been in this job for a little while, about a year, I think. I was working then. I'd finished the mental health course, and somehow I was told by my boss, there's a very difficult doctor coming down every week to Oxfordshire hospitals. He's very devoted, but he doesn't like social workers, and he's making a muddle of things. You want to go and sort things out. That is what he told me, and we very much liked this introduction we had to each other. So I just turned up, you know, routine, you do your job. He was at one of the reception centers, and I listened for a while one afternoon and saw things. He was very suspicious of me, and he said, I shan't want a lot of case histories from you. You know, social workers take case histories. And I thought, marvelous. He said, I shall want observation. Can children play? Who do they play with? Can they be creative? Can they play on their own? Can they group? I want observations of what they're like. I don't want a lot of history. Looking at me very suspiciously as to say, you know, it's up to you. Can you do it? He came down once a week and I would go around to whatever, whichever hospital he was at and listen and see what went on. And gradually, I could see where I could contribute because people would say to me afterwards, you know, he never tells us what to do and how he leaves us with these terrible children. We never know what to do. He never tells us what to do. Of course, you can imagine he'd never attempt to tell them what to do. So I thought, how do we get around this one? I said, well, look, don't you think he's always in London? He can't tell us what to do down here. He can't be at the moment at which we've got to do something about something. So isn't it best if we do the best we can in the given circumstances, and then we think about it, and we tell him about it when he comes next time and see what he says about it. Shall we try it that way? He always said, I gave him a place in the scheme, and I think it did help a lot, but we did it that way round. Staff were always looking and saying, quote, the doctor must tell us what to do. He's the doctor. He's got to tell us what to do. But of course, it couldn't be done that way in this kind of job. So I told my, so my role really is trying to help people to see that it couldn't be done that way, and that we've got to find a way of using him as best we could. Well, you can't imagine that these sessions where he came down every Friday, and went round to the hostels. We had 90 kids all together in the hall with them. And these sessions became tremendously important learning experiences for everybody, including him, certainly for me and the staff. So that was her introduction. And soon Claire was working full time in Oxfordshire, looking after 80 children scattered around these five hostels. Now in their co-authored articles, they reported that the children exhibited a wide range of disturbances including antisocial behavior, depression, and even psychosis. Donald visited on Fridays, but their articles explicitly stated that in practice, the social worker, quote, controls the whole of the work and is, quote, the one individual at the center of the scheme. Claire provided continuity to the hostels as staff came and went. She played a key role in the placement and transfer of the children and she consulted regularly with hostile staff. 
who was the only person who knew, quote, each child at every stage. Their co-author article continues along these lines in explaining, quote, that the social worker saw the child in his school and his billet, a foster home, and then in the hostel, and possibly in more than one hostel. If there is a change in hostel wardens, it's a social worker who gives some feeling of stability during the period of change. She's also in contact with the child's home, visiting the parents wherever possible. She is thus in some degree able to gather together the separate threads of the child's life and to give him the opportunity of preserving something important to inform him from every stage of his experience. And that phrase, she was able to give him, to gather together the separate threads of the child's life. I think that has a lot to do with what social workers often do in working with children, that we're not often not just working with the child in the consulting room, but we're dealing with the school. We may be dealing with the parents, with other agencies, and you're sort of bringing together all these different parts of the social network. Reflecting years later, Claire reflected on their collaboration. And she said, I saw that my first task is trying to evolve a method of working so that all of us, including Winnicott, could make the best possible use of his visits. The staff living in the hostels were taking the full impact of the child's children's confusion and despair and the resultant behavior problems. And you have to imagine these staff, well, now we would call them paraprofessionals. They had no professional training. The staff were demanding to be told what to do, and it took time for them to accept that Winnicott would not, and in fact, he could not take on that role because he was not available and not involved in the day-to-day -day living situations as they were. Gradually, it was recognized that all of us must take responsibility for doing the best we could with individual children in these situations. Then we would think about what we did and discuss it with Winnicott as honestly as we could. These sessions with him were the highlight of the week and were invaluable learning experiences for all of us, including Winnicott. His comments were nearly always in the form of questions, which widened the discussion, and never violated the vulnerability of individual staff members. After these sessions, Winnicott and I would try to work out what was going on from the mass of detail that had been given us, and we would form some tentative theories about it. Now, both of these recollections and their jointly authored articles clearly delineated Claire's leadership role in directing the hostile scheme and Donald's secondary role in, as a consultant. In no way could this relationship be described as one of clinical supervision. And I have to say, when I started exploring this material, it took me about three years before I really understood what was going on between them. You always start to think about, you know, that the doctors here and the social worker is, you know, works underneath them at their direction. But clearly that was not happening in the relationship between the two of them. Claire's autonomous creativity involved, merges in several recollections for her work in Oxfordshire. The challenges of this work under chaotic wartime circumstances cannot be underestimated. The caseloads were large, the resources were limited, and social work had no recognition. Besides such mundane responsibilities as ordering the supplies, she focused her effort in consulting with the hostel staff in order to help them endure the strain of working with such difficult children. I'll try and re read aloud her recollections then. She said, we didn't produce miracles, but we did help staff to work without fear to face situations, even pretty drastic ones, like setting fire to something without too much fear and with compassion. I think that came into it. Why has this happened? How do I rescue so-and-so? We had all kinds of disasters, like the wrong staff being appointed and everybody running away one night, everybody. And I was the whole, night, whole of the night driving around Oxfordshire, my car with no lights, no signposts, map reading with a torch, a flashlight. 
the police telling me where these kids were. The police were picking up them up. Some hair raising things went on, but we survived them. And I think this is one of the things that Donald did help us all to do, to survive things and that something good could come out of even the most awful crisis if you could survive it and carry on and not give up. You know, somebody rings me up in the morning and says, so-and-so was on the roof. And this was a very big hostel, a tall building. So-and-so is on the roof. He's been there for the last hour. Do we get the fire brigade? So a decision's got to be made. I said, well, I'm not all for not getting the fire brigade. The boy will come down by lunchtime, but I have to check this out. So I ring up my clerk and I say, what about it? I'm taking this risk. Are you gonna back me up? He might say, well, what would Winnicott say? So I said, I can't get Winnicott on the phone anyway. It's no good. We've got to decide that. So things like that happened often. One of the things that happened, as you saw in Bechtel's slides, is of course these kids were uh, had very little contact with their parents and terrified about the survival of the parents, fathers in the military, and mothers who would be sleeping in London bomb shelters. It's little wonder these children suffered from nightmares and bedwetting. And Claire recalled, she says, I think one thing I'd learned is the children who were in touch with their parents, whose parents wrote and visited, were in much better state than the children who never heard anything from anybody. So one of the things I did there was to ask permission to go up to London and try and find the parents whose addresses we've got of the children who never heard from them. I spent several days whenever I could get the day up in London and I was allocated a WVS driver. We went round to the addresses we got. And we did find a lot of the parents. Often we found a completely bombed down finished road and sometimes we could locate the parent in the rest center, but not always, and some were killed. And what I did there was to try and make a link between the parents, and I actually got such a name for it that every time I appeared into a hostel, the children would rush up and say, Miss, have you seen my mom? When did you see my mom last? And it was quite hard for them when I had to say, I can't see your mom every week, only every now and again but it did awaken some parents to their own responsibilities in regards to the children. Because I could say, look, he's missing you terribly. What about a no? Give me something to take to that, take to him or something like this. So we did work very hard to make links between home. And I think this was very much encouraged by Winnicott and the benefit was also seen by the staff. So this gives you a flavor of just to sort of creativity. Now what you see, what you can hear here too, is the beginning use of transitional objects as a way of connecting the parents and the children. Give me something to take to them. And sometimes it would be a note, sometimes it would be a little piece of food, a bag of grapes, uh, something that she could take to the kids. And she understood instinctively the role of that uh, therapeutically for these children. Now, I'm gonna take you on a journey through the archives using some of the letters and reports written by Claire and Donald. And you can see, you'll be able to see some of the original material of their uh, communications during the war. Okay, so this is just an example of, you know, how they kept records in some of these kits. And I. I put in pseudonyms for the names. So you have John in the first row, and it says what hostel he's at. It says when he's admitted, when he's discharged, something about the home, his mother was evacuated, the symptom, violent rages, result, good behavior, no difficulty. Destination, he left to join his mother. Letters since show a satisfactory result. The third one here is Henry. And he has a refugee mother and sister, both, quote, good type. And he stole in the billets. He had, had enough, been through bad experiences in Belgium because of the war. And then his adjustment was quite satisfactory, clever. 
and he left to go to a good Jewish school. So this was probably a child who was involved in a kinder transport or something like that. Uh, further down, we have Dennis uh, says at home, the mother was deceitful, but home exists. The father is separated. Problems included bedwetting, dirty habits, antisocial. I say, well, no real change. Tru truanted, returned with his brother. Mother returned, removed him to his home. So this gives you just a little flavor of just how they were recording this. Now, here's a letter that Claire writes to Donald in uh, 19, March of 1943. And I'm just going to skim through it. Dear Dr. Winnicott, thank you for sending your last book report. I did understand about others, and they were not at all muddled up. I realized the temptation put them in alphabetical order, thinking that that might have been a plan in your arrangement. I've not passed on your, your awards. And then skipping down, sad news. Fitch had to be told to go from Orchard Lou immediately, probably one of the staff. Things have reached such nightmarish proportions that it was necessary to weigh one of them up. And it had to be Fish, Fitch. I hate these dramatic moves and I'm sorry about it. And then further on, may I say one word or so about my difficulties, i.e. the paper I showed to you, because I feel you don't really know what I mean. I don't want there to have people under me to tell what to do. It hadn't occurred to me that this was attenuating my present problem, and it isn't. For one thing, I want to do something myself, and for another, I should drive anybody mad in a week. You see, I often don't know what it is to do myself until the instant of doing it. Anyhow, this isn't the point. I can say it all another way. It's that I want to do everything, but something constructive to make up for all the horrid things I do, like putting kids in awful institutions. I am not prepared to be simply a mover about of children. I want to have some contact with the life of the hostels. Problem, what is my way in, so to speak? Without some real basis, I feel I am a fraud in any way, non-functional. But here I am at the old question, what is the function of a psychiatric social worker? Perhaps I shall find out in time. I wonder if you appreciate this difficulty for your own professional always gives you the right of entry. And it is a real and honest and harder and right. Sorry about all this. I won't want to talk about it again for ages and ages. Uh, with best wishes, Claire. So this is March 1943. Here's some notes um, from um, uh, May 1943. Dear Dr. Winnicott, I'm going to be my, let myself be presumptuous enough to make one or two childish remarks about your article on delinquency. You said I might. I've enjoyed reading and thinking about it tremendously. Thank you much for lending it to me. I've learned a lot from it. First of all, when you were discussing the function of the good home and how the normal trial uh, uses it as a prop, it seems to me that possibly you have not sufficiently brought out the importance of the home is the social unit, but this may well be so as I am not sure how it is for implicit in what you have said. You've said that delinquency is a vicious circle in relationships of child to society. And I'm gonna skip ahead here and just read down here just a bit. This, she started typing this letter after writing it. Uh, thieving and masturbation. I really don't really understand this. Will you tell me sometime? But I can see the connection as you have explained it. But in this case, is the child really antisocial and delinquent? Isn't he using thieving much as the boy who takes apples because he's hungry for some personal reason of his own, not really involving a deep conflict with society? So here you have, uh, and then you know, questions I wanna ask you are, what are the roots of aggression? I see that you must hate 
what you love, because that is part of growing up and being an individual. But what else? The parts the superego can play in making delinquents. What kind of personality becomes neurotic in that delinquent? About discipline. Uh, how far accept aggression? At what point does a child begin to destroy itself? Uh, so she's beginning to think with him in a resonant way about his ideas. Now, here we're up to December 1943. Thank you for helping me yesterday uh, with the staffers. I cope fairly adequately. This may turn out to be a long letter, but I will try hard not to let it be, to make it as legible as possible. And I'm afraid it's all going to be about me because I'm going to flap. The point is that suddenly yesterday morning, I was asked if I would go for a job interview on Monday next for a job as prin principal officer for training at the youth leader sponsored by the National Association of Girls Clubs. This is rather out of the blue as I hadn't applied for this job. I merely said at some stage I was interested in this sort of work. There is no doubt about it that this is a big responsible job and I'm not likely to get such a good offer again. Much more not likely to get such much more money for one thing and a job that I feel needs doing badly. Also between you and me, quite honestly, I think I could make a quite useful contribution to the youth movement. I could give, that's the point in a small way. I'd be important. And somehow I need all that. I could do the job and believe in what I was doing and that what I could give would be of value. And I long, as don't we all, to be able to give and take to limit my capacity. That has never happened in the job I'm doing now for various reasons, but it's happened in other jobs. So I know I'm capable of giving so that the one thing that does seem clear is that I must find better jobs. Of course, I know it is important to get married, as you once said to me, but that is very difficult because of never meeting anybody. I'm seriously thinking of joining the marriage bureau in Bond Street. Do you think it's a good idea? Oh dear, I'm getting lost. That's because of doing my best writing. Well, what do I want of you in all this? Perhaps you know better than I, but I know that I'm not asking you to solve all of my problems for me. I promise I will never ask that, but try as I will, I can't make a decision about this job without reference to you. All day I've tried, but then suddenly I felt that perhaps you wouldn't mind if I wrote, it seemed right to do so. You can see something that does affect my decision about the new job. Do you still think I could come to Paddington Green where Donna works? If you think it's still a good idea and want it, is it really possible? Because I still think I would like to try it, although I don't imagine it will solve all my problems by any means. It just come to me that what I'm really weighing up is that wherever I, whereas I know I can be the sort of person who could do the club training job, and do it well and make a name for myself. What I don't know is I can be the other sort of person who can deal satisfactory with personal relationships, which the other job really means. And this is what I want reassurance about terribly badly. It is really a question of deciding what sort of person I am. Isn't it incredible that anyone could write a whole letter about themselves? But I'm going to send it as I might feel like talking when I see you on Tuesday. I'll hope you make a very good broadcast and that it won't be too nerve wracking. He was giving broadcasts on the BBC. I hope it will be successful and he will be asked again and will become very famous. Anyway, I've needed to keep the plasticine model I did of you in case one day I can sell it for a large sum. It was meant to be Sir William Be Beveridge, but it turned into you, Claire. And, uh... Here's like a report from uh, January 1944 that both of them write together. At that point, they have 110 children uh, in three groups. And let's skip past this. Now, this letter, August 4th, 1944, is very interesting. Dear Donald, dear Dr. Winnicott, 
I think you were very hard on people. And that means at the moment on me. Now, I don't mind that so much as I mind the fact that you seem so unaware of it. Sometimes your lack of imagination staggers me. I'm sure you've got no idea I'm still angry with you from last Friday. Well, I am. I think something was definitely due to me after sweating on that report from Mrs. Volkov. It wasn't easy to make take that material of yours and uh, make it into something that is at least a whole. And I know that last Friday, I didn't want you to commend or thank me for it. I would have loved criticism, but I did want some real reaction to it, and you owed it. And I work, wonder very much why I didn't get it. And yet I know that you're, you were tired and overworked and everything else, and I'm writing to excuse you. While I was working on the Volkov thing, I realized how much you have helped me to understand in these last three years. And I am grateful to you so very much. So I have to say thank you, especially thank you for being able to appreciate me as a person, for I know that you do go deep down, but that doesn't stop me from being angry just now, especially as I brought a heavy load of case files from Oxford for the committee report, nor does it stop me from working to, wanting to point out that working with you may be fun, et cetera, but it is not without snags, and I feel I pay heavily for every bit of fun I get. Obviously, this is so in every bit of the work. It is part of what you demand of other people. Guns all the time here, aiming at the doodle bugs. These are little rockets coming down from, from Germany. A lot came down in the sea, but it's nerve wracking when they're going over and being shot at, as you may imagine. When I'm stopped being angry with you, I shall be glad that you and Mrs. Winnicott enjoyed last Wednesday and a good time was had by all. I swear this is not the source of my being angry and that I planned last Friday to say these things. And then a little postscript. You make heavy demands and don't forget it at all. I've had to learn to do with a lot of things in this job. Somehow I've managed after a fashion with your help. I don't regret one minute of it, but for God's sake, sometimes show that you understand if you do, which is doubtful. I don't know what you will think about this letter. And honestly, I don't care. Perhaps I've not spoken plainly enough. Do you want chapter and verse? Please write or tell, write and tell me off if you feel like it. That would be real and I can take it. You are not God to me, although I am angry with God as well. One of the nicest and best people I have known died in the Radcliffe last week, a young and charming boy. Um, perhaps you'll feel I'm most ungrateful to you. I might be grateful for your asking my help, but that does not excuse you for ignoring what I had done last Friday. I felt you were being dishonest in some way, but I am quite prepared to be told off of you to be as honest as I've been. Um, I want to know if you understand at all about my job. I will forgive you if you don't, but I should like you to try. And then things change some months later, and not this letter is undated. My dear, I'm afraid you would be terribly tired on Friday night by the time you got home, and hungry too, and I only hope I hadn't made you miserable as well. I hated to see you cry and seem unhappy. You know, it, wouldn't be, it wasn't long enough time Really, that's why it was difficult. I want you to know that I am better, less depressed, relaxed somehow. So don't worry about what you've done to me, et cetera, because you've given me so much happiness. And today I knew it and feel it and I'm grateful. Last week had been bad for me physically, as well as in the job. I was very surprised when I said that you drained me in the last few weeks. Well. I suppose in a way things couldn't happen to you unless that were so. And also somehow I'd taken responsibility of your love for me as well as mine for you. Just like me to cope with everything in sight. Somehow I've had to, but now you are coping that relieves me of the burden. I loved hearing about you on Friday and I'm glad I called your bluff. I know I should regret it and I only hope that you will, won't but I don't think you will somehow. Today I've eaten an enormous amount of food 
They had four gins and a cider and a lager. Yesterday, I heard so-and-so play Chopin, preludes, waltzes, wonderful, just what I needed. I let it flow all over me like cold water, refreshing and purifying. In the evening, I saw the cherry orchard. This is also just what I wanted. So you see, I am better. And now I know I'm going to sleep well too. So good night, love from Claire. I just want to open it up for some reactions now with these letters. Um, just stop talking for a bit. Anyone have any questions or things they want to share? I'm just curious if there are responses from him. She destroyed all the letters that came from him. Well, it makes them um, more human. And, um, I don't know. I was smiling through a lot of what you were reading. You know, I, I thought the whole thing with that caddy letter where she's talking about taking the job in London. Maybe I should go to London and take this job. Maybe I could work at your hospital. Maybe I should go to the marriage bureau and find someone. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, my impression was very flirtatious in her own way, but she stuck it out in Oxfordshire for the rest of the war. And my guess is that she, she didn't want to go into London where his marriage was. It would have been much more difficult to have had the affair and the collaboration in London, uh, which they were able to do in Oxford, an hour out of town. Um, and so I think, I think that was probably a way, a reason that she did not take these job offers. Uh, it allowed the relationship to percolate uh, being at some distance. I, I think she also, she's so interesting because she's, she's so resilient and so much about sticking with the wear and tear of just the situation. And that's what really strikes me about her. And that's where she gets really furious with him when he doesn't really, uh, at least from her perspective, recognize the toil that she goes through just to kind of hold things together, to gather the threads together for the children. And I think that part of being a child therapist is so, um, in a way, not talked about enough, just the wear and tear of what it is to be a child therapist and the resilience that it takes. Um, she's very uh, interesting in that way as a, as a young woman just coping with so much. It's just incredible what she's coping with there. Um, but, and then, then how he, his presence just kind of helps her kind of think about herself in all of it. That's quite impressive, so. The directness, I mean, you know, imagine writing with this kind of directness and her, her, you know, you know, how, A, how in touch with her own feelings she is and her willingness to share this with a man in authority. I mean, you know, that was not something, uh, the men were doing, men and women, women were doing in the 1940s. I'm not sure how often they do it uh, uh, currently. That's, you know, pretty nervy kind of thing. I could imagine her, um, it's interesting that she was analyzed by, by Klein. I can imagine her just really, because she's so much her own self, just <laughs> butting up against her. That, that kind of makes sense to me. She, she was not that, by the way, you know, she was born in 1906. So at mm. the time of the war, she's 38. She's not a 23-year-old or 25-year-old. Uh, you know, she's had lived experience. Um, mm. It's a 10-year age difference. Uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, not uh, extreme. Any other comments about these? Yes, I'm Janet Castellini. Um, okay. I have to listen instead of watch today, but um, I think uh, just as sort of the conversation was going, and her candor was very striking to me, and it made me wonder about 
how she regarded their relationship before they had a relationship. Like what, how, how was it that she was able to do that? I mean, we were just talking about her being her own person. Uh, that's, that's one possibility, but I was wondering what, what it had to say about their relationship. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Well, you know, I think his first wife, Alice, by many accounts, I mean, A, she had, it's, it's worth saying that she had, from as best we know, had no interest in sex. And the marriage with Donald was never consummated. Uh, and, and there's sadly a story. His first analyst was uh, James Strachey, uh, the, you know, the translator, of the standard edition. And while he's analyzing, uh, um, analyzing Winnicott, he writes a letter to his sister where he talks about his analysis with Winnicott and how Winnicott was impotent. And he puts that in the letter uh, to his sister, which is obviously a gross violation of confidentiality. Uh, and those letters, uh, since the Strachies were part of this Bloomsbury group, those letters were published uh, many years later, I think in the 1980s. And so we learn, we have, we learn about that. You know, my take of the last letter where she talks about his crying, you know, I have this, my own fantasy of that letter is they sleep together and the sex isn't working out well and he's sad uh, because again, he's having trouble with uh, sexually and, uh, and he's feeling guilty about, you know, um, the affair and, um, and so she's trying to reassure him and help him deal with those feelings. I see that as relief about having a sexual success as well, given that history. That's possible. Uh, the other thing that that I think about is Winnicott's paper, Hate in the Counter Transference, uh, comes out. It's first given orally, I think, in 1947. And at that point, he's struggling uh, with this affair, his guilt over it. He's not comfortable leaving his wife while his father, his 92-year-old father, is still alive. And you know, what, what's in that paper is that how you can feel hate towards people, like towards a baby who's innocent. You know, it's not towards necessarily someone who's done something bad to you. And I often think of this paper as struggling with his feelings about his first wife. Uh, uh, she had not wronged him, but, but he was, at that point, he, he was ready to move on. You know, and um, uh, and struggling with his, you know, maybe his own hatred of his first wife, uh, but you know, without having any great, uh, uh, you know, grievance for having that hatred. Uh, so I have to think of that, uh, and and then of course you see. Um, Claire, you know, putting feelings into words in a way that's really pretty damn unusual at that time when people were able to speak with that kind of emotional directness. And particularly in, in yeah. England, I think that was tremendously <laughs> unusual. Yo, this is Wally. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the reference uh, when she was talk talking about her visits with the kids and bringing, out, bringing back pieces of, um, of things that could serve as transitional objects. And that's one of the places where um, I think you alluded in, in some of what I read of yours about things that Winnicott appropriated from her, um, some of which he acknowledged and some of which he probably didn't. But um, would, you, would you say a little more about a couple of, I'm, I'm thinking also of the uh, of her writing about the holding environment, which is... You know, let me go, you know, like go back to sort of my talking a little bit about their, you know, uh, 
how they work together uh, and what she learned from these experiences. I'm gonna read a bit of a paper that was unpublished from a talk she gave in 1946 after the war. And um, just to give a flavor of the sophistication of her thinking, and this is, you know, it's worth saying, okay, at this point she's 40 years old. She's not had any formal psychoanalytic training. Uh, obviously she's taken in a lot from Donald. Let me just share a bit about this. She says, all children who come into the hostel have one very important thing in common. That is the failure of their own homes or foster homes to tolerate them and their difficulty. For all these children, the critical point of breakdown has been reached and they have known the frightening experience of things having, of quote, things having gone too far. Help has been sought and decisions made and life as they have known it disintegrates. The point of breakdown may have been reached early or late in the child's experience. The home may have been disintegrated quickly at his first efforts to prove its worth, or it may have stood a great deal up to that point and given much that the child needs. Uh, each child has come a different way to the point of breakdown and each story with its inexorable tangle of cause and effect is peculiarly the child's own. Of course, the important thing for the hostel is at what point in the child's emotional experience did the break occur? Now, just a bit of language here is one of uh, the important papers of Winnicott's, which was actually published uh, soon after his death, was called Fear of Breakdown. And she's using this language of the breakdown here. And Claire, there was only one paper she ever published in a psychoanalytic journal, and it was called Fear of Breakdown, a Clinical Example. And you can find that on PEPWeb, and it's really a lovely paper, very much worth reading. Uh, so she talks about, uh, here she's talking about breakdown. You also, the idea of the, the hostile, you know, taking this sort of battering from the child. So the, the home may have disintegrated quickly at his first efforts to prove it worth, or may have stood a great deal up to this point and given much that the child needs. And I'm hearing something in here, if people are familiar with Winnicott's paper, The Use of the Object, um, which is arguably one of his most noted papers uh, done in 1968, uh, presented at the New York Psychoanalytic Society. Uh, and one of my takeaways uh, from Winnicott that I think about a lot in, in working with children, I, I call it the Timex, Timex watch approach uh, to parenting. And you might remember the motto, it takes a lick and it keeps on ticking. Um, and that was the ad line for Timex. But it's one that I often share with parents or teachers or whatnot, uh, that that's very much the job. And that's very much comes out of uh, Winnicott's uh, thinking about dealing with the aggression of the child, that one needs to hold it, to contain it, to survive it. So that's one, this is one echo you see very early on uh, of now uh, she goes on there quite beautifully and evocatively before this point is reached there's much suffering and difficulty to be endured by the child and the hostile staff the first stage is reached when the children are sure enough of the hostel to transfer their home difficulties into hostile life thus saving their own homes and enabling them to construct a perfect home in fantasy on a totally unreal level. Those of us who have worked in hostels, and I'm sure anyone who's worked in foster care or residential settings know this, they're all familiar with the child's, quote, wonderful homes, which even the child from the worst background can create and will often actually run away to find. If the hostel can stand firm and allow the children to work through this stage, 
and gradually real relationships with hostel staff can be formed. And slowly the child can build up ideas of home based on real experience in the hostel. Now, another piece of work that she does is her first solely authored paper in 1945. And it was entitled Children Who Cannot Play. And as anyone, if you've read Winnicott, you know about his work and talking about uh, the importance of play, and play inhibitions. And Claire is writing about this um, in 1945. She writes, in the early days of the evacuation, I met a six-year-old boy who was the most completely cut off child imaginable. He never spoke of his own accord, and he only answered questions reluctantly. For a short time, he refused food. He was completely docile and inactive and walked around in a dazed fashion. He was incapable of learning anything in school, and play was out of the question. He simply sat and watched people. It was not surprising to learn that both his parents had been killed in the air raid shelter from which he had been rescued. Fortunately, he was put into a good foster home where the foster mother understood something of what he was going through. She became fond of him, but did not try and force herself on him. She let him go his own way at his own pace. Could you see a better description of holding or containing? After about 18 months, the boy began to respond and recover. His first efforts at play were pathetic and he would look sheepish and give up if anyone noticed him. He played only when alone with the foster mother, when her own little boy was out with the other children in the village. She would plan these occasions when time allowed, and she would sit there knitting and reading. He would play with bricks, stopping always when anyone came in. Gradually, the play became more complicated, and one day he actually built an air raid shelter and played out his parents' death, suddenly asking, does it hurt to get killed? All this time he had been grappling with the experience of his parents' death and only when he felt secure enough with his foster mother, when he had grown new roots in his environment, so to speak, could he face the fact of their death and let them go. This he was able to experience again and again through play till he had accepted it. It's, to me, this is, and this is a woman who's never had any formal training in child therapy. I mean, this, to, you know, my reading of that is if it came from an experienced child analyst, you would think it would be a very evocative piece of work. But somehow she had that kind of sensitivity very, very early on. You know, I have some evidence that uh, Donald did not help her write that paper. She actually got help writing the paper from her brother, who was a philosophy professor. But, and, one of the things that you see in her writing and communicating, Claire never uses a bit of jargon. Uh, when she teaches about the transitional object uh, in her life, she referred to it as the first treasured possession, not as a transitional object. And she used to, uh, after Donald died, she would sort of joke about his narcissism by telling a story of how he wrote uh, Charles Schultz, the Peanuts cartoonist. And he writes Dr. Sh I mean, Charles Schultz a letter and says, uh, uh, you know, I'm Dr. Winnicott, you know, big shot psychoanalyst in London. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, I developed the concept of transitional object and how did you learn about Linus and the blanket? And uh, Schultz writes back to him, basically, dear Dr. Winnicott, I've never heard of you. And I learned about the blanket from watching children. <laughs> and, but the sort of amusing part is Claire telling this story about Donald, who she loved dearly, but sort of te making fun in this teasing way about his own narcissistic proclivities. So these are a few things. Now, just to be specific on this, is in 1950, uh, she writes a chapter um, for 
the social work text um, about what you might say is the transitional object. This is uh, a year or two before Donald's paper on transitional object comes out. And she writes, the moment of uprooting is just when a skilled social worker is needed to see what a child clings to in the past is brought with him and accepted in the new environment. There are many stories which now it is hoped belong to another era of children clinging to their own clothes and being given an anesthetic to enable a clothes to be removed or favorite but filthy teddy bears and other possessions being taken away and burned. But these possessions did not belong to the past and something became damaged and lost when the familiar things were taken away. These possessions stood for everything the child brought with him from the past and he could not afford to lose so much. And a year after this comes out, uh, May of 1951, uh, Donald presents his paper on traditional objects to the British society. Uh, later in the same paper, she talks about delinquency issues in a way that you find five years later in Donald's paper, The Antisocial Tendency. She says, the social worker comes into the lives of these children, she must first be able to sort out the whole situation carefully until she finds a live bit from which new growth can come. For the live bit is the thing the child is clinging to as the focus of his feelings, it may be hidden in a memory or a fantasy or a habit. It will certainly be at the point of tension. The delinquent act is in many cases an unconscious effort to deal with loss. The depression and grief of a child who has lost a loved parent shows he is alive and dealing with his loss and that with help, recovery is possible. Perhaps the most difficult children to help are those with nothing alive about them. Here, the only thing is to wait and watch for signs of life, encouraging the slightest effort, which can be made perhaps towards possession of something or the sudden desire to sit next to someone special. Now, the third contribution uh, that I think uh, Claire had something to do uh, with was the idea of holding. Let me just uh, do one little screen share. I'm going to tell you how I got. You may wonder, why did I get into this crazy uh, project? So there's a very well-known paper of Winnicott's called The Theory of the Parent-Infant Relationship, 1960. It's the first paper where he really starts to work about, talks about a holding environment, which you see here. Uh, the main feature of infancy is its dependence. At the very bottom of that, in the version of that paper published in the Maturational Processes, there's a footnote, one of the only footnotes that Donald puts in any of his papers. And it says, for a discussion of holding and casework, see such and such by Claire Winnicott. Uh, something called child care and social work. And, and I saw that, I think in 1985, 1986, and it took me three years to find that book, what that was. And that's what sent me on this journey. Because so I was curious. Uh, and in 1989, I was at the University of Chicago Social Work School teaching uh, a continuing education class, and in their library was Claire's monograph. And uh, that was the beginning of my introduction to her. But in this paper written in 1954, it was entitled Casework Techniques in the Child Care Services. And it was interesting, this paper very unusually was published both in a social work journal in the UK, it was also published in Social Casework in the United States. And she writes in this, we become, so to speak, a reliable environment, which is what these children so much need, reliable in time and place. And we take great trouble to be where we have said we would be at the right time. We take deliberate trouble to remember all the details about the client's life, and not to confuse him with other cases. 
we can hold, and she puts hold in quotation marks, we can hold the idea of him in our relationship so that when he sees us, he can find that bit of himself again, which he has given us. This is conveyed by the way in which we remember details and know exactly where we left him in the last interview. Not only do we hold a consistent idea of people, but we hold a difficult situation which brought the client to us by tolerating it until he either finds a way through it or tolerates it himself. If we can hold the painful experience, recognizing its importance, and not turning aside from it as the client relives it with us and talking about it, we can help him to have the courage to feel its full impact. Only as he can do that will his own natural healing processes be lib liberated. She goes on, I have deliberately used the word hold in what I have been saying because what obviously includes acceptance of the client and what he gives us, it also includes what we do with what we accept. And so here's, you know, another sense of this. Now, sort of the final contribution, which I've had hints of already, is just beginning to deal more directly with counter-transference. And, you know, in these recollections, she talks very directly about her feelings with phrases like, we all went through hell. We all struggled, struggled with this mother. We got very disappointed. They were frightened stiff. Uh, and, you know, being aware of her feelings uh, about in doing this work it comes throughout uh, throughout this. And I'm gonna try one more screen share of her work as a therapist. And this is from a case um, where uh, that she started in the 1970s with a troubled woman. Uh, actually this woman was seeing an analyst was renting a room in um, uh, Claire's home after Donald died, rent renting a consulting room. Uh, she really needed the extra money. And uh, the analyst suddenly died of a heart attack when the patient came to her. And uh, it was uh, very difficult. Um. And she went, she was extremely... Can you hear this? To ...tolerate this time. She was so... Difficult. There's still a yes. problem. And she was, again, completely silent for a long time. Uh, I dreaded her sessions. I got to the stage of dreading her sessions. You know, when, when she, the bell rang, I thought, oh, gosh, you know, how am I going to tolerate this again? Another day. Uh, and it made me feel a complete failure. I thought, I've lost her. Then I kept thinking to myself, what is she doing to me? What's happened? What's happened? And I didn't know. I went on feeling an absolute failure with her. I, I would say things, but with no response. It was just deep despair. Um, then one day, uh, I very much got in mind, I must work out what she's doing to me. Of course, I felt a failure myself. It took me a long time to think, look here, she's doing this to me. Not just me failing. Um, then one day she said, uh, I don't know why you bother to talk. I was doing my usual patter, like I'm still here, you know, or whatever. Don't know why you bother to talk. I cut your words off as you say them. So I said, yes. She said, you must know this. I cut them off as you say them. So I said, yes, I do know. It. I suppose I only talk to let you know I'm here. Um, Oh, yes, I know what I did say. That's important. I said, um, I suppose, I suppose I only talk in case one day you will hear. Another day she said, you're too dumb to know what's going on. <laughs> and I felt it. I felt it. I, I mean, by this time I was almost on my knees. I really felt dumb. I felt stupid. Then I thought, come on, get yourself out of this. It's not you, she's doing it to you. What is she doing to you? So I said, I thought to myself, yes, yeah, she's making me fail. 
And why haven't I seen this before? I've got to get to the failure. I've got to fail. Uh, so I put this into words for her, that I thought she had to make me fail. Uh, and I thought it was to do with her early failure of her mother who went away when she was five months. And the link had never been made with her mother, again. And I thought it had to do with the early failure of her mother, only this time with me. She'd taken control and she'd made me fail. So that she was in control of the situation. Uh, but I, oh yes, look, mm, left out a point. You see, this is why I, I've not written a paper, so it's a bit haphazard. But she had given me a hint. After she'd said these two things from, to me, like, I don't know why you bothered to speak, and you're too dumb to know what's going on. She came back the next day and said, uh, what, how terrible of me to say that to you yesterday. But I've been longing to say it for months. But you see, I was afraid of saying it in case you would stop. So I noted that. So I knew that when I came to the crunch point, which was the failure point, that I had got to not stop. So I said, look, let's face it. I have failed completely, as your mother failed you. But you, this time, you have caused the failure. You have brought about the failure. And you're in control of the situation. You, you, this is your thing you've done to me. Uh, you had to make me fail. But I'm not, but yes, I added very quickly, but I'm not giving up. In a flat voice, I tried to make it flat. Um, um, well, I mean, from that minute on, a lot of, a lot of things happened. I mean, we went over this again, you know, that, that the failure was her trial. She triumphed. Uh, over the whole situation and I, I think I knew I felt I knew what it was about if she could feel in control of the situation omnipotent control of me and everything at least she could perhaps incorporate the failure into herself so that it's not a permanent threat to her forever that was what I hoped would happen and it really in a way did happen that was what has happened um And that, you know, I said things like it was her, she had been responsible for destroying the analysis. And I felt destroyed. Um, well, gradually, a lot of changes take, took place. This was almost at the end of a, a, a summer break. Um, and I came back. Oh, no, wait a minute. I did notice some things before the holiday. That's right. Yes, believe it or not, she came in a new dress. I opened the door, and she was in a bright blue dress which was quite momentous. The coat was left off. Then one day she came with a less extraordinary hairstyle, which she'd done herself to herself. She cut her own hair uh, to try and change herself. I just think this is, I mean, this was 1980. I mean, this is relational psychoanalysis um, in 1980. Uh, at least that's my read on it. I know other people want to share thoughts about this. I, I was thinking of Racker's theories of, of counter-transference and how, how much further John Racker, I mean, in terms of, uh, of a, a really understanding of the, of, of the transference phenomenon, this goes. Uh, I mean, it's Racker kind of... Uh, shows the formula for it but he i've never heard him uh uh speculate on what the value of the of the counter transference phenomenon is i mean the it's all you know in the context of this very human interaction you know that's worth saying what you just saw by the way was not she did not write this out this talk was given from notes and you just have a sense of the, you know, the spontaneity and her own uh, creativity in speaking. She also kept it within the, the two of them. She didn't go back and belabor the past. Right. It seems like it's right out of the, the child work that we were just hearing about, too, that she 
somewhere deeply understood that she would have to accept being ruined to, to really get this patient's experience of, of having lost all at five months. In the same way, the children that she worked with in those early that were evacuated, she, she got something just so intuitively about their need to kind of ruin things to, in order to get on with it and how she had to kind of hold and accept that experience of being kind of ruined and survive it and then just accept it. What's refreshing is that she says, I failed, yes, I failed you. Like that's, that's utterly refreshing that she could just put that out there and accept that. Yes, she gets that the patient did that to her, but that she doesn't, she doesn't say that until she first says, yes, I failed you. One of the things I'm very excited about is that the, the patient who I met back in 1996 told me, basically told me to destroy this material, uh. which, which I ignored her about. And then I had the, I would intermittently check to see if, uh, if she was still alive. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I look or Google her and she's chair of the ethics committee of her professional organization. So it's like, <laughs> I, I, I can't do anything with this. And finally, about a year ago during the pandemic, uh, uh, I don't know, I got the nerve up to contact her again. And she was very happy to, and we had some Zoom calls and she's now, uh, uh, happy to, she, we went over, we edited a few things for, for confidenti confidentiality, but not very much. And she's writing her own memoir, she's written her own memoir of the, ther of the analysis. And it's just going to be great to have the pairing of Claire's thing. And then both her recollections of her treatment, but also her experience reading Claire's discussion of the therapy. Uh, I think it's something that's very rarely emerged in our literature. She you went yeah. from being wrong to be, uh, as a patient to being right as an ethicist. <laughs> yeah. Other comments or questions? There were a couple of comments in the chat. Joel, did you want to take a look or you want, would you like me to read them? Um. Did Claire talk about her feelings of not having her own child? child? Uh, I, I know I talked to at least one uh, colleague that she expressed uh, her regret about this too. By the time they get married, by the time, you know, Donald diddles around with his divorce, separating this and that, you know, in 1951, she's, um, you know, she's 45 years old. And the family story is she they, she goes to the, wherever the government office where you register the marriage and to get her marriage certificate. And because she was so youthful looking, uh, the clerk says, well, I guess you'll be having babies soon. And, um, but obviously she was past the point where that was possible. Um, one of my thoughts in regards to this, by the way, is I think that Winnicott's idea of the good enough mother encompasses everything about parenting that Winnicott knew he couldn't do. Um, you know, he just, you know, he liked to breeze into the lives of children, breeze out, but he had real respect for what you know, mostly mothers did 24 seven in providing the holding, the physical care and whatnot, uh, the good enough mothering. Uh, it's not anything very glamorous. It's not very Kleinian, you know, uh, but it's necessary. And uh, he had respect for that, but I think he would have been constitutionally unable to be a good father. That's just my unsolicited opinion. Well, and he diddled around, so maybe he couldn't have any children or give her one. 
right, as you point out, yeah, maybe. Well, the absence of his letters, I think, is really interesting. It, just in the way it's presented here, it sets it up, it kind of puts him in a God position. Like she's talking to him, reflect, her letters are so reflective. She ta always talks about how much she learned from him, but I kept finding myself thinking, what did she learn from him? Like there was, it was hard for me to hear anything that she actually learned from him. And there, I mean, I'm sure it was there, but the way, just this whole, the whole setup of her, her letters being so kind of literary and um, personal and his being absent it, and she referred to him, or I guess in one of her letters, she said that he, wa he wasn't God to her. She made that point, but it's interesting. He wasn't God, but she made the sculpture of him in hopes he'll become famous. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, I mean, just, uh, you know, her playfulness in that regard. I mean, those letters have a lot of playfulness in it. And uh, I don't think anybody accused his first wife, Alice, of being playful. Uh, she was both smart and sensitive and playful, and they had a lot of fun together. Um, it was very, uh, um, you know, everybody is, is uh, like two people use the, that I, who knew them, one a social worker, one a psychoanalyst, who knew both of them. And in characterizing their relationship, they both use the same phrase. They said they sparked each other off. And, uh, and that's what uh, uh, both people, both of these people who knew their relationship, that was their uh, sense of that. Uh, the excitement that went on between these two uh, all the time. Um, another little story in that regard, you know, on Sunday mornings, uh, he would, um, he was analyzing Masud Khan, who of course, you know, had his own, I don't, I think it was really a crappy analysis. And um, that's another story. But on Sunday mornings, Khan would come to their house and edit uh, Winnicott's writings. And at noon, every day, every Sunday, Claire would have to come down and basically kick Khan out of the house. It's like, it's my time now. And uh, uh, Khan was not happy about that. And one thing that Khan was very, really not happy about is when Winnicott died, Khan thought he would be the literary executor. But in, in Winnicott's will, he made Claire the, the literary executor. And she really didn't want a lot to do with him, sort of cut him out of the publications process. Probably had a lot to do with him going off the rails. He was very narcissistically wounded about that. And yeah, it looks like we're out of time. Yeah. Joe, thank you very much. You've certainly, you've certainly given us a sense of that spark. And uh, um, uh, I want to hold up, you can't see it very well, uh, Joe's book. It's got a number in addition to his wonderful long essay chapter of the biography, some of which he shared tonight. There are wonderful papers from Claire that um, you really get to know her and, um, and the ways in which she integrated uh, social work and psychoanalysis in, in really brilliant ways. Uh, Joel, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, um, I wanna thank all of you for being with us and sharing this. And um, we will have another opportunity on uh, November 17th. And um, we'll be talking about uh, applied analysis and some uh, ways of thinking about that in different contexts. Um, so um, be well, and thank you again, Joe. And um, thank you, Joel. Thank, thank you. you. Thank You're you welcome. so much. Thank you, Joe.